Hidden Messages in Beatles Films. Number four, Yellow Submarine. In this video, I shall be deciphering the esoteric messages contained within the 1968 animated film Yellow Submarine. In my previous video about the influences of Lewis Carroll on the Beatles, I outlined a comparison between the stories of Alice in Wonderland and Alice Through the Looking Glass to the plotline of Yellow Submarine. I will not repeat those ideas here, so instead I shall put a link to that video in the description. I also made a video about the Yellow Submarine playing card imagery, which was taken from the animation. I shall put the link to that video in the description box for this video too. So let's begin. The animation starts with a narrator telling us that once upon a time, or maybe twice, there was an unearthly paradise called Pepperland. Eighty thousand leagues under the sea it lay, or lie, I'm not too sure. With this narration, we are introduced to the idea of doubles and allusions to the sci-fi novels of Jules Verne. The first pictorial image we are greeted with is this one. It's actually more important than you might think. A lot of Thelemic ideas are expressed here. We have six men who between them produce a rainbow of five colours. In both alchemy and the magic of Thelema, the five and the six represent the five elements of the microcosmic world and the six planets of the macrocosmic galaxy surrounding the sun. When combined via the rituals of the pentagram and the hexagram, they demonstrate the unity of all things. In Thelema, this union symbolises the great work, which is the knowledge and attainment of one's true will, via knowledge of one's own holy guardian angel, which is the higher self. These micro and macrocosmic ideas of the five and the six also superimpose onto the Kabbalah tree of life. The great work completed is expressed in the word Abrahadabra. Under the rainbow is the word love. This reminds us of the second part of the Thelemic Maxim, which begins, Do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. But the second part is, Love is the law, love under will. Next we are shown around Pepperland, and in particular, we see the Sergeant Pepper head. Alistair Crowley died in 1947. In 1967, we were told, by the man who purports to be his son, that it was 20 years ago today that Sergeant Pepper taught the band to play. The presence of the Sergeant Pepper head is symbolic of several concepts, such as the ideas of Crowley, his son, Billy Shepherd, aka Billy Shears, and also Paul McCartney when he suffered a fatal head injury. Later on in the film, we will see the head visually die and go underground, only to be resurrected later by the Beatles' music. As the music of George Martin continues, we see the musicians responsible for it, including the Lord Mayor. These characters, especially the Lord Mayor, represent the older generation and their outdated ways of thinking. Panning across, we see two people playing at one piano. This is a reference to the two men at a piano trick that George Martin and Billy Shepard use frequently in the Beatles music, especially when the piano part was too difficult to be played by one person. Following a butterfly, which itself is used to signify mind control programming, we see two disembodied hands clasped together. On the surface, this is a sign of friendship, but underneath, I suspect, it's also a reference to Masonic hand grips. George Martin and Billy were both Freemasons, even if the other Beatles weren't. Now we finally see the Sgt Pepper's band, playing on a bandstand to an audience of Pepperlanders. It's interesting that the Beatles, along with Paul, 
were given a funeral on the front cover of the Sgt. Pepper's album. Despite the fact that none of the original Beatles were wind players, the Sgt. Pepper's band that came to take their place were all wind players, just like Billy Shepherd. Visually, the message given to us is that they were John Lennon's band, but now they are Billy's. Ringo's winged hat is just like that of the Greek messenger god Mercury. He in turn was the Greek equivalent of the Egyptian god Thoth, who was an important figure within the religion of Thelema. Crowley's Thelema prophesied the coming of a new age. The Sergeant Pepper's band are the communicators of that new age, the Aeon of Horus. In contrast to the paradise world of the Sergeant Pepper's music, the Blue Meany Army want to hold back the spread of the New Age, with its own skewed notions of love, knowledge and unity. The creator of the original images for the animation, Heinz Edelmann, actually said on the documentary that accompanies the Yellow Submarine animation, that the Blue Meanies were loosely based on the Nazis. To me, this is very interesting because the Nazis were also fascinated with the occult, and the Beatles' record label EMI had links to Nazi Germany, and also made use of ex-Nazi musicians. We are told about this on page 54 of the Memoirs of Billy Shears. In the Zodiac Killer's letters from 1970, the idea of a blue meanie is also featured. I Am A Phony also picked up on this in his videos. It's interesting to note that both the murders of the Zodiac Killer and the Tate LaBianca murders of 1969 have links to the Beatles. Lyrics from You Never Give Me Your Money and Helter Skelter were found scrawled on the door at the Tate House. According to John Lennon's personal assistant, Fred Seaman, John wrote the words Helter Skelter with a paintbrush on his office wall at the Dakota, just before these filing cabinets were installed. The Blue Meanie Chief has a personal assistant called Max. I've always wondered if this was a reference to the MI5 spymaster, Maxwell Knight. According to page 367 of the Memoirs of Billy Shears, he is the inspiration for the Beatles song, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, which is in turn a reference to the murder of Paul McCartney. Maxwell was the agent that, quote, made sure that he was dead. He was also the agent that recruited Alistair Crowley into British intelligence work. It's also worth noting that the Blue Meanies have ears like Mickey Mouse. On page 23 of Memoirs, Walt Disney is described by Theodore Adorno as, quote, the most dangerous man in America, because... His animations were laced with subliminal messaging to brainwash the masses, and especially children. The animation then introduced the audience to the rest of the characters, starting with the bulldogs. This is not a picture of four individual bulldogs. It's one creature with four heads and many pairs of feet, as we shall see later. It relates to the beetle beast that John Lennon drew. Billy talks about the Beetle Beast several times in memoirs. He even devotes an entire chapter to it in the book, relating the phenomenon to the second of the three beasts discussed in the Bible's Book of Revelations. Just for qualification, the first beast is the dragon from the sea, thought by Christians to be the devil. The second beast, from the earth, convinces everyone to worship the first beast. The third beast is the one ridden by Babylon, the whore, and she is sacred within the religion and magical practice of Thelema. The apple bonkers are symbolic of people in suits from the corporate world that keep creative people down. Bear in mind that, although Apple was the Beatles' company, they were not businessmen themselves and had no real business acumen. Therefore, they were forced to hire businessmen, even though the Beatles were probably resistant to the idea. The clowns have heads that turn 360 degrees around. They contain alarm systems that warn the blue meanies of perils. The snapping turks 
always remind me of the comedian and stage magician Tommy Cooper, because he also wore a fez. Then we see the Blue Meanies artillery. And finally, the anti-music missile and the flying glove, which is the chief Blue Meanies pet. The anti-music missile forms a bubble around the Sergeant Pepper's band and stops them from playing to the Pepperlanders. Without their music, the Blue Meanies and their minions were quickly able to turn the whole of Pepperland grey and dull. This includes the Sergeant Pepper's head, which then goes underground, both literally and symbolically. This is akin to the occulted ones waiting underground to launch their plans. The Chief Blue Meanie laughs merrily as Pepperland is captured by his cohorts. I haven't laughed this much since Pompeii, he says. This is a curious thing to say. Is the inference that the Blue Meanies were around during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, which covered the neighbouring area in ash, essentially freezing that area and everyone in time? Or is it also a reference to the Holy Roman Empire, which established the first one-world religion of Christianity, which the Beatles and the controllers that sponsored them were fighting to demolish? Next we get a sort of visual joke involving homonyms. The word no, as in knowledge, is reduced to no, as in the negative. From the perspective of those who promote the new Aeon of Horus, the Aeon of Osiris that came before it is characterised by the negative no. The Aeon of Horus is characterised by the positive yes and knowledge. Let me state clearly that that is their opinion and not mine. The Flying Glove is sent to hunt down one of the few survivors of Pepperland, which is Old Fred. He trips and lands on top of the crocodile floating down a river, with the drum head of the Sergeant Pepper's band on its back. Note that both Glove and Fred are pointing to the mirror-based encoded message on the drum head, which secretly reads, 9-11 he die. This refers to the date of Paul McCartney's death. According to Thelemites, Paul McCartney is the risen Osiris, who dies once again to transmigrate his soul into the body of Billy, who is considered to be the returning Horus of the new Aeon. In the Egyptian mythology of Osiris, his brother Set kills him. However, before he does that, he first simply tries to banish him. Set tricks Osiris into getting into a box, which is then nailed shut. That box is sent floating down the Nile River among the crocodiles, just as the Sergeant Pepper's drumhead, with its death message about Paul, is floating down the Pepperland River. Old Fred runs off to find the Lord Mayor, who is still playing with his string quartet. He will not listen to Fred's warnings about the Blue Meanies until everyone, except he and Fred, have been turned into living statues by the Apple Bonkers. Fred, carrying the frail old Lord Mayor, runs to the ziggurat at the edge of Pepperland. Whilst ziggurats are more commonly associated with South and Central America, the earliest ones were Sumerian and date back to at least 4000 BC. Whatever else their purpose was, they were used to communicate with and make sacrifices to their Sumerian gods, who were most likely Anunnaki in origin. They include Enlil and Enki, whom Billy mentions in memoirs several times, along with their planet of origin, Nibiru. It's also worth noting that the MI6 building in London is nicknamed the Ziggurat, as well as Babylon on Thames. Some people claim that the Ziggurat of Ur, in modern-day Iraq, is or was the location of a stargate. The yellow submarine sits at the top of the ziggurat, and we are told by the Lord Mayor that it only appears in moments of peril for the Pepperlanders, as though it was sent by the gods in answer to a distress call. The Lord Mayor makes Fred an admiral, and tasks him to rescue Pepperland by returning with outside musical help. Fred climbs onto the anchor to gain access to the craft. Although Pepperland is said to be under the sea, the yellow submarine 
operates more like a spaceship, with the anchor symbolising a tractor beam. As the yellow submarine flies off with Admiral Fred, the top of the ziggurat explodes and resembles an active volcano. The apple bonkers catch up with the Lord Mayor and bonk him, turning him lifeless and grey. So many apples are dropped on him that it resembles a stone-piled grave called a cairn. At the opening credits, it is revealed that Yellow Submarine is starring the Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band and not the Beatles. This makes sense if you realise that the Beatles as a band actually died along with Paul. This Sgt Pepper's band is the replacement. This is another very important image because it relates to alchemy and the tarot. Alongside the yellow submarine, we briefly see three more submarines in blue, red and green. These relate to the elements of water, which is blue, fire, which is red, and earth, which is green. Yellow is associated with the element of air. This makes a lot of sense when you realise that on page 94 of Memoirs, we are told that each of the Beatles were featured as a suit of the Yellow Submarine playing card deck. Paul dominated the spades, which is equivalent to the swords in the tarot deck. The swords are also associated with the element of air, which is represented by the colour yellow. For completion, George was clubs or wands, which is elemental fire. John was diamonds or pentacles, which is elemental earth, and Ringo was hearts or cups, which is elemental water. We see the yellow submarine hovering above the other three submarines, just as Billy, replacing Paul, operates above the other beetles. Additionally, it's worth noting that the Fool card in the tarot deck, which is symbolic of Billy, is also connected to the element of air. All through the opening credits, we hear the song Yellow Submarine. When the Beatles sing, we all live in a yellow submarine, they are saying they live in Paul, since the submarine represents Paul and his grave. They live in Paul in the same sense that a Christian lives in Christ. In memoirs, it is indicated that Donovan helped to write the song Yellow Submarine, which is interesting because the last song that the real Paul McCartney sang on was Donovan's Mellow Yellow. Paul is the one whispering Mellow Yellow on that song. On page 268 of Memoirs, Billy says that when Paul died, he was ripe for the event like a banana. There is also another macabre idea that links the death of Paul to the colour yellow. In medieval alchemy, there is an idea that each person is born with a given amount of years of life force. If a person dies prematurely, for example at the age of 24 from being ritually murdered, then those years of life force, which are stored in the blood, will go to waste if that corpse is simply buried. To make use of those unspent years of life force, alchemists exsanguated the body and distilled the blood for consumption, usually by a sick or dying person. When the red blood cells are extracted from human blood via the distillation process, the liquid that remains is a vivid yellow in hue. Given that Paul's funerary rituals were probably akin to that of an Egyptian pharaoh, it is not so far-fetched to think that this alchemical process was also applied to him. After the opening credits finish, we see sunrise over Liverpool, signified by its most famous structure, the Liver Building. There's clearly Egyptian mythology at play here. Horus and the sun god Ra were later merged as one being in their mythology. This is often depicted by images of the rising sun. Equally, Hadith, one of the three voices of Crowley's Book of the Law, 
is symbolized by a winged sun disc. The yellow submarine sails past a grave as Eleanor Rigby is playing. The grave headstone here reads, Number 49, Here Lie Buried. The four relates to the four letters in the name Paul. The nine relates to the nine letters in McCartney. Beneath is the name William Macmillan. Possibly the name William relates to Billy as William Shepherd, but it could also indicate someone else. For example, William Macmillan was the name of a Scottish sculptor, responsible for many pieces of stone-carved street art which can be seen all over the UK. Perhaps they substituted one Scottish William for another. Eleanor Rigby continues to play, reminding us of all the lonely people, and showing other depictions of death or isolation. For example, here we have a man trapped in a coffin-like red phone kiosk. Next we see the words newsroom and a watch. I wonder if this relates to the newsflash seen by teenagers in America that told of Paul's death, with the full details to be given at 11pm that night. Those same teenagers stayed up until midnight waiting for the information to be relayed via the news report but it never came. Equally, it could be related to the Birmingham reporter Sam, who knew about Paul's death. Memoir says that he was paid off to keep him quiet, but I suspect that they used more permanent methods to maintain his silence. The yellow submarine flies past a building where a man appears to be about to jump off. With imagery like this, why do people still think that this is a story for children? Following the Yellow Submarine, we see a football match between Everton and Liverpool FC, shown in their usual colours of blue and red. Equally though, this could be a reference to the blue and red lodges of Freemasonry. As we hear the lyrics, Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name, we see a crying motorcyclist, followed by a lot of warning road signs. I wonder if this is a reference to the moped accident that Paul was said to have had in addition to the car crash just before his death. I believe, and I know I'm not alone, that Paul was actually beaten up in these photos. We have to wonder why he would ask his brother Mike to take photos of him in this condition. He also looks scared of someone in these pictures rather than someone who has just been in a motoring accident and I've been in a near-fatal motoring accident, so I should know. Finally, we meet the first Beatle of the film, which is Ringo. He is shown wandering around on his own in the same way that he was in the first Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night. To the left of him, there is a hidden triangle or pyramid, which I have highlighted with a red circle. We follow Ringo down Hope Street, which is a real street in Liverpool. Paul's old grammar school, the Liverpool Institute, is on Hope Street. That's where he got to know George Harrison. The art school that John Lennon attended was next door. It seems strange to have Hope Street introduced to the audience by Ringo, who, due to extensive childhood illness, barely went to school. Here we see an all-seeing eye over Ringo, and the words late of written on the wall to the right, as in Paul McCartney, late of Liverpool. A policeman calls to a passing cat. If you listen very carefully at this point of the film, you can hear him calling the cat Paul. The yellow submarine follows Ringo up a hill to a building called the Pier, where Fred bangs on the door and pleads with Ringo to help him, using the lyrics to help, of course. Fred then says, H is for hurry, E is for urgent, L is for love me, and P is for please. Except that urgent doesn't start with an E. I know that this is a subtle spelling joke, but they do actually accidentally end up spelling the word for help in Dutch instead. The desperate Fred throws his hands up to the skies and shows us the first of dozens and dozens of occasions where a character demonstrates the horned hand symbol. 
I didn't even try to collect all the screenshots for every time this happens in the film, because there were just too many. In a hand-drawn animation, this cannot be an accident. Those hand signs are deliberate. Fred is allowed inside the Pier Museum and meets up with Ringo, who says that he will help Fred, but first they must find his friends. Along the main corridor, there are many doors leading to surreal activities and characters. One of these is this battleship, whose name is written in mirrored letters. It reads Potemkin. The Potemkin was a Russian battleship in the 1905 Russian Revolution. Famously, the crew mutinied. Maybe the subtle message is for us to mutiny and join the Beatles in the new Aeon of Horus. Passing through the museum, we see a collection of cult characters. From left to right, we see Marilyn Monroe, Satara, Buffalo Bill, Flash Gordon, The Phantom, and the 60s British TV show, The Avengers. Like Billy Shepard, Marilyn was also subjected to a mind control programming. Hers was in the form of the Beta Sex Kitten program, which was meant to encourage other women to dress and act like her on-screen persona. Satara the Magician was a comic book character that said spells backwards, just as Crowley encouraged his followers to be able to perform most tasks backwards. The Beatles used backmask lyrics about Paul's death throughout their songs right up until they disbanded in 1970. Buffalo Bill is a reference to Billy's real name, but he was also a fellow high-ranking Freemason. The Phantom was another comic book character that had several nicknames, including the Ghost That Walks, the Guardian of the Eastern Dark, and the Man Who Cannot Die. All very appropriate for this situation, where Paul supposedly lives again in Billy. Flash Gordon is well in keeping for this story, which feels more like a journey through space than under the sea. The Avengers TV series was about espionage, and in a sense, so were the Beatles. According to the documentary that was made alongside Yellow Submarine in 1968, the reason why John Lennon is introduced as Frankenstein's monster is because he was a published writer, and the script writers wanted to give John's entry a literary feel. This seems like a seriously lame excuse. They had the whole world of literature to draw from, and they chose a monster. The truth that they were concealing was that the transformation theme of Frankenstein really belonged to Billy. Ringo even recycled the idea in his music video for the song Back Off Boogaloo. George, the mystical one, is introduced through a door on another spiritual plane, accompanied with sitar music. George plays a little game with the others, driving back and forth in Ringo's car. Each time he drives past, the colours of the car have changed. It's all in the mind, you know, George tells the others, which is the tagline of the animation from its movie poster. This feels a little trippy for the watching audience, which is the point. It's like we're being gaslit into participating with the New Age. The three Beatles and Fred all climb into Ringo's car. As they drive off screen, we hear an extended car crash, an obvious reference to Paul's car crash. The characters run back on screen and along the corridor to find the new Paul. I'd like to point out the frieze over the top of the doorways. It appears to be a row of ram's heads, with their connotation of spiritual sacrifice. In the Egyptian language, the word for the personality of the soul is a homonym for ram. Both are ba. The sacrifice and soul is Paul's, but also Billy's, because he gave up his own life to play the role of Paul. Whilst continuing to search for the new Paul, the three Beatles and Fred open a doorway with King Kong inside. 
This gorilla is a reference to Billy's other band, the Bonzos, whose first comedy album was also called Gorilla. That album was released in the same year that Yellow Submarine was. It contained the song Look Out There's a Monster Coming, in reference to the Frankenstein-like transformation that Billy has had to endure. Behind another doorway, we see a steam train about to run over the assembled group. John saves them all by slamming the door shut on the train. George once again delivers the tagline, It's all in the mind, you know. Whilst a dazed John flashes a double-horned hand. Finally, we hear the sounds of a classical concert, most probably a piano concerto. We see the new Paul played by Billy. In the Yellow Submarine documentary, it states, Paul is introduced as a modern Mozart, playing serious music in a museum. He emerges from the audience with rapturous applause. This is a sly way of telling us that Billy, unlike Paul, is a classically trained musician. With the Beatles united, they follow Fred back to the Yellow Submarine. Once on board, we hear the song All Together Now. We see this image with five Beatles, two Pauls, one greyed out because he is dead, and one in vivid colours, as well as the other three Beatles. As the Beatles sing the words all together now, forwards, we also hear I buried Paul in the back mast lyrics. Sailing through the sea of time, we see many figures of Father Time, all of whom have scythes, normally attributed to depictions of death as a being. The yellow submarine sails through a broken head, referring to the condition of Paul's head after his death. The Beatles spy another yellow submarine from the window of their own, a reference to the Beatles' doubles. The submarine they see is actually their own submarine, but in the past. Whilst travelling backwards and forwards in time, the dials on the control panels move up and down wildly. The last year we see on the dial is 2009. I thought this was interesting, because 2009 was the year that a lot of Beatles merchandise was released, including remixes of all the albums in mono and stereo and the Beatles rock band. It was also the year that the first edition of the Memoirs of Billy Shears was released. There's also a cheeky 666 on the far left dial, obscured by not being fully lined up. Continuing on through the sea of time, we see headless figures and demons, again, relating to the condition of Paul. Next we see a Lamas, a Sumerian protective guardian being. These are normally winged balls with human-like heads, but here we have a cow, which was sacred to Hathor, the Egyptian goddess that restored Horus's sight. Again, it's lost its head, just like Paul. The winged boots and shoes correlate to those of the winged goddess Mercury whom we mentioned earlier. By this point, we hear When I'm 64. This was the first song Billy sang as Paul and contains the lyrics Grandchildren on your knee sang in a Scottish accent. As the yellow submarine sails into the sea of science, we see a totem pole of the Beatles with Paul at the base since he is the base of the incoming new religion of Paulism, which is promoted throughout the pages of memoirs. Due to the squared-off nature of the imagery, it's possible that this is also a mortuary pole. Many Beatles doubles are seen flying out of a box. Then they are flying around in patterns resembling the electrons of an atom. The whole section is psychedelic and accompanied by only a northern song, in which we are told through its lyrics that the band is not quite right. Sailing on to the Sea of Monsters, we encounter the vacuum monster. To the left of the screen appears three objects, a petrol pump or gas pump, a pyramid and a tie that we just saw the new Paul character wearing. 
This reinforces the idea that Egyptian mythology, as well as Ka's, was an important factor in Paul's death. Inside the yellow submarine, we see Ringo accidentally hit the panic button and get ejected out of his seat at the helm. Fred suggests the remaining Beatles become a trio, but the new Paul insists that they rescue Ringo, calling him a poor devil. With a reference to the Beatles' fake adversaries, we very briefly see a banner extended out of the back of the yellow submarine, reading The Rolling Stones. Trying to appease one monster, the yellow submarine offers a cigar and a light, accompanied with the sounds of Bach's air on a G-string. This is a musical joke related to the adverts for the Hamlet brand of cigars, which were very famous in Britain. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar. And any Brits in the audience will remember that advert. Next we see red Indian monsters chasing after Ringo. He is then rescued by the 7th US Cavalry and returned to the Yellow Submarine. The reference here, I think, is the Battle of Little Bighorn. Just as we think the Yellow Submarine, the Beatles and Fred are all safe, the vacuum monster starts to suck up absolutely everything, including the backdrops and even himself. It then turns inside out and we find ourselves back inside the Yellow Submarine. For what it's worth, this is my favourite bit of the film. All this commotion has broken the tiny motor of the yellow submarine. George tries to fix it, but instead he gets an electric shock. This is probably a reference to the short period of time that he spent training as an electrician's apprentice. But it also serves as an accidental foreshadowing of the shock that George gets off a mic in the Let It Be or Get Back documentaries. With Billy turning to the engineers and saying, if this boy dies, you're going to cop it. In the new blank world, the Beatles meet Jeremy, the pseudo-intellectual. John greets him by asking, who the Billy Shears are you? As he points to Ringo in the background. On the Sgt Pepper's album, Ringo sings the next song after the Billy Shears character is introduced. That's why many people believe Ringo is Billy Shears. But of course... That's what they're meant to think. Ringo was only the diversary cover for Billy as the new Paul, who was the real Billy Shears. To introduce the character of Jeremy to the audience, we see a montage of the skills this Renaissance man possesses. He seems to be a Mr. Fix-It figure, like Billy was within the Beatles. Also like Jeremy, he is a nowhere man. At the end of that song, we hear Jeremy confess in rhyme that, quote, If I spoke in prose, you'd all find out. I don't know what I talk about. As the yellow submarine exits the Sea of Monsters, we see an Egyptian sphinx and a demonic-looking bull. Possibly this is a reference to the pagan god Moloch, who is usually associated with child sacrifice. But equally, this figure could relate to Apis, the Egyptian god usually depicted as a bull, who was the son of Hathor. Apis was an intermediary between humans and Osiris, and he was also sacrificed and reborn. After fixing the broken propeller on the yellow submarine, Fred is unable to stop the craft from sailing off without the Beatles and Jeremy. We hear Fred calling for help as he sails away. H is for hurry, E is for urgent, L is for love me. George then finishes by saying, P is for goodbye. Which of course makes no sense, unless you understand that they are saying goodbye to Paul. For the cover of the single, Yellow Submarine, the Beatles are seen holding a cutout of the craft with a P clearly seen in the middle. Also note that Billy is making the 666 hand sign 
and John is flashing the horned hand. Between the foothills of the headlands and the Sea of Holes, we see a sequence based on the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. In memoirs, Billy talks about this song actually referring to the light of Lucifer and how Lucifer illuminates with knowledge. As part of the animated sequence, we see many dancing stars, which are the points of light of Lucifer. Many years later, George H. Bush will talk about a thousand points of light as a reference to volunteerism, but I suspect the old bonesman was actually referring to the light of Lucifer too. At the top of the screen, we can see a depiction of Lucy based on the child's drawing by John's son, Julian. This innocent story is the cover for the underlying Luciferian scheme. Later in the sequence, we also see a horse and rider whose colours change. At first, we see them as a woman on a pale horse. Perhaps this is a combined piece of biblical imagery. The whore of Babylon, who is sacred within Thelema, crossed the four horsemen of the apocalypse, with a pale horse is that of death. In this case, the death is Paul's. I've included an image of the lust card from Crowley's tarot deck, on which the whore of Babylon is riding her beast. In the sea of holes, Ringo picks up a hole and puts it in his pocket. He can't help but flash the horned hand while doing this, of course. At this point of the story, the Beatles make the obvious jokes about the lyrics of A Day in the Life, which also contains references to Paul's death. They then make a homonym joke about the Holy See, which is a reference to the Vatican's papal seat, known as the Holy See. They are poking fun at Christianity here, but they are also letting us in on a dark truth, that the Luciferian agenda has been secretly trying to invert and replace Christianity, while simultaneously trying to infiltrate it. Ringo finds the opening to the Sea of Grain. In the song, it refers to the field of grass growing over and around the buried pool. In the animation, it is the entry point to Pepperland. The Beatles arrive in Pepperland on the ziggurat, that the Yellow Submarine uses as a port. Note that they made their way there not with the Yellow Submarine, but symbolically via Paul's gravesite, the Sea of Green. They discover the Khan of Apples piled up over the Lord Mayor. Next we see the Yellow Submarine with Fred hanging off the anchor as the Yellow Submarine comes into port at the top of the ziggurat. Fred explains to the Beatles who the Lord Mayor is. He asks the Beatles to sing because their music will unbonk the Lord Mayor and return him to life in colour. A grateful Lord Mayor and Admiral Fred embrace while Fred clues in the Lord Mayor about the Beatles. Walking over to the Beatles, the Lord Mayor provides the audience with an in-joke about the Beatles' use of doubles. It's uncanny, he says. You could pass for the originals. Notice too that everyone is flashing the horned hand. The Lord Mayor, Fred and the Beatles walk down the ziggurat. The Lord Mayor tells the others his plan to save Pepperland. You could impersonate them, meaning the Sergeant Pepper's band, and rally the land to rebellion. This is clearly a reference to the 60s counterculture movement, with the Beatles leading the youth to rebel against the standards of the older generations. The Beatles are leading everyone from what the Thelemites regard as the age of oppression into the new age of light and knowledge and doing what thou wilt. The Beatles go through the rainbow gateway to where the Pepperlanders are. We see them grey from a lack of love and music. Passing into the blue mini battlegrounds, we see that the apple bonkers are still at work. And so too is Glove, 
who is terrorizing the citizens, who are helpless without music to protect them. The Beatles hide beneath cutouts of ordinary people and make their way to the bandstand, where the musical instruments have been confiscated and kept behind barbed wire trees. They wait for sunset and for the guards to pass, so that they can run up the hill to the bandstand. Note that the word sunset relates to the solar battle between the Egyptian gods of Horus and his uncle Set. As they run under the cover of darkness, they get spotted by a guard who tries to gun them down. And then they get caught in a searchlight. As they freeze in the light, they all throw up the horned hand. As the light passes by, they run into the bandstand. Inside the bandstand, they find all of the Sergeant Pepin's costumes and musical instruments. Tripping over some of them, they throw a set of Highland bagpipes out of the window, which bounces down the hill playing a Scottish tune. Could this be another reference to the Scottish Billy? Could this also be a reference to the grave site of Paul, which is generally considered to be on a hill on Billy's Scottish farm? Somehow, all of that bagpipe music doesn't wake up the sleeping blue meanies. Realising that they are surrounded, the Beatles don the Sergeant Pepper's costumes and sleep in the bandstand overnight. They awake to the musical joke of morning mood from Grieg's Pierre Gint suite. We see the new Paul climbing out of a double bass case. This is surely a visual joke because Billy is the new Paul doubling for a bass player. The double bass case also symbolises a coffin, or perhaps a sarcophagus. The Beatles, dressed as the Sergeant Pepper Band, look out the window to see that they are still surrounded by sleeping blue meanies. Amongst them is one of their minions wearing the number 23. This relates to the two Pauls and the three other Beatles, and is also seen on the album cover of Yellow Submarine. According to Crowley, the prime number 23 is also the glyph of life in its nascent form, which is very appropriate for the birth of a new age. As the Beatles tiptoe down the hill and pass the blue meanies, Ringo throws up the Masonic and Thelemic sign of Hippocrates, showing that he is keeping a vow of silence. It also indicates the silent aspect of Horus. In Thelema, Horus is one person with a twin aspect. One part is an extrovert, the other an introvert, and is silent. Startled by the awakening blue meanies, the new Paul gives us a moment of one-eyed symbolism. By closing the eye on our left, he is closing the eye of Horus and looking through the eye of Ra. The hungry beetles run off to find food and discover the apple tree that is being used to bonk people into submission. This scene has biblical overtones. It's as though the beetles are eating from a forbidden tree of knowledge. The Beatles begin to play Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band as a way to unbonk the Pepperlanders and bring everyone back to their former colourful lives. It's worth noting that the Beatles are posing as a wind band, despite the fact that none of them are wind players. This is because Billy is the wind player and the band now belongs to him. During the song, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, we see the drum head again, but this time an extreme close-up. 9-11, he die, is silently screamed in our faces. As we hear the lyrics the one and only Billy Shears, we see the Sergeant Pepper head resurrected from under the ground. The land becomes lush, green and beautiful again. This ties in with the idea that Billy 
is symbolised by the Fool card. Crowley's version of the Fool card is associated with the Greek god Dionysus and the return of spring. As the final chorus of Billy Shears is heard at the end of the song, we first see the new Paul in a close-up before quickly panning away to John, who takes off his costume. This is a little bit of sleight of hand. For just a moment we see the truth and that it has taken away and deflected. The new Paul is Billy Shears. Also, notice with this close-up that the new Paul's eyes are Egyptian in style. Then we hear the opening of With a Little Help from My Friends, with its reference that Billy has borrowed from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. He means it by way of a paraphrasing. He comes to bury Paul, not to praise him. The hills are alive, cries the chief blue meanie. With the sound of music, answers Max. Who is responsible for this, cries the angry chief. Wibsky Korsakoff, replies Max. I'm not a hundred percent sure of what the reference is here. It could be the number five, since rimsky korsakov was part of the Five, also known as the Mighty Handful, a group of five composers whose influence on every other Russian composer after them is legendary. Equally, it could be the nature of their collective works, which pushed musical boundaries in classical music, particularly because they included influences from many different forms of music, especially Eastern influences, just as the Beatles did in pop music. Having tried to kill Max repeatedly, the chief blue meanie pulls him in close and tells him with menace that heaven is blue, whilst throwing up the horned hand. Note that the blue meanies have six fingers on each hand, which is Billy's favourite number. He's all about the sixes. The chiefs demands to know who started the fight back against their attack, drift across the land, and are countered by John, who breathes the question of who into existence on screen. Visually here, we are being asked, who is the new Paul? In what is probably a subtle hippie reference to pot smoking and free love, John then breathes the word glove on screen, and then smokes it to become love. We are then entertained with a lyric video of All You Need Is Love. The direction to learn how to play the game is given to us, the audience, as well as being a suggestion from John to Billy in his role as the new Paul. With the Blue Meanies close to being defeated by the Beatles' music, we see George Harrison jumping off the Sergeant Pepper's head and drifting slowly down to ground with a 50-pound sousaphone on his back. It's all in the mind, you know, he says, for the third and final time. Symbolically, Pepperland is reversed from a land that says no to one that embraces the knowledge of the new Aeon of Horus. The Beatles, still dressed as the Sergeant Pepper's band, run off and stumble over the blue glass bubble that is holding the original Sergeant Pepper's band members as prisoners. Ringo uses the hole from the sea of holes that he has kept in his pocket to release the original Sergeant Pepper's band. Once released, they remark on how alike they are to each other. This reminds us of the photo from the filming of the Beatles' Help movie that shows us their use of doubles. As the Beatles and their Sergeant Pepper's band doubles run off, we hear the song Hey Bulldog begin to play. Again, we see the multi-headed bulldog beast as a reference to the beetle beast and the beast's revelation. In the crossfires of the battle with the remaining Blue Meanie army, we see one of the clowns die and immediately get buried on a hill, most probably like Paul did. Out of the piano that is playing Hey Bulldog, we see the Beatles' heads facing both up and down. Could they be alluding to the hermetic maxim of as above, so below? 
All of the Beatles and their doubles run off again, apart from Ringo, who spies Jeremy being held captive by the chief, Blue Meanie. He goes back to rescue him and untie him. As a true pseudo-intellectual, Jeremy tries to learn karate out of a book, which of course does not work. Then Jeremy tries a different tactic. He says a magical spell out of another book and makes a rose bloom out of the chief blue meanie's nose. After the success of his first magical spell, Jeremy then covers the chief blue meanie with flowers. Unlike the karate book, this magical book is unlabeled. This has been a sly way of injecting the concept of magic into the story of the animation. Tired and defeated, the chief blue meanie points out to Max that it's no longer a blue world and asks him, where should we go? Max replies, Argentina? Bear in mind that the art director of this animation said that the blue meanie army was inspired by the Nazis and also that alternative historians say that Hitler and several other high-ranking Nazis escaped to Argentina. Fortunately for the Blue Meanies, they don't have to run off anywhere, as John Lennon and Jeremy offer to make peace with them. The chief Blue Meanie closes by saying that they will join everyone in peace, since his cousin is secretly the Bluebird of Happiness. The Bluebird of Happiness is an idea seen in many cultures, but it's probably first seen in China, where the Bluebird is the messenger of the Queen of the West, who is the wife of the Jade Emperor. In heaven, she had a garden of peach orchards. She would offer those peaches to her guests. Eating the peaches would make her guests immortal like the gods. This subtly ties in with the underground plan discussed in memoirs to make the public believe that Paul and Billy are gods sometime in the future. The animated part of the film ends with a full psychedelic display, accompanied by the song It's All Too Much. First of all, we are treated to another totem pole, complete with horned hands and sunburst imagery of the new Aeon of Horus. Then we see the face of the sun with Egyptian-styled eyes and a snake-like lower lip. Now we see the beetles on the hill with their new friend, the chief blue meanie, rejoicing in the light of the new age. A full cast shot ends the animation with Love, the Ziggurat and the Yellow Submarine now in view. Again we are being told that love is the law, love under will. Finally, everyone climbs aboard the yellow submarine as a symbolic bark of Paul as the Egyptian god Osiris. We are watching his soul sail into the sun and to the afterlife. Also note the sly number six in this shot. Compare the yellow submarine to Ra's solar bark of millions seen on the wall of the temple of Seti. Finally, we see a cameo appearance of the Beatles. This cues up the entry of the final song of the film, All Together Now. Every time you hear them sing All Together Now, remember that they are also singing I Buried Paul backwards. If the Sgt Pepper's album was symbolically Paul's funeral, then the Yellow Submarine animation represents his resurrection into the body of Billy Shears and also serves as an introduction to the Aeon of Horus. I thought I would finish by showing you the Aeon card from Crowley's Thoth deck. Hopakrat is Horus in his passive form, shown by the transparent boy with a vow of silence. Rahakut is Horus in his active form, shown seated on his throne. These two gelistic aspects combine to form the complete Horus as Haru Ra Ha, the third deity of the Thelemic Trinity. The Aeon of Horus is the current age, where the individual is the basis of society. Nuit 
is the first deity of the Thelemic Trinity. She is the starry night sky and infinite space. Hadit is the second deity of the Thelemic Trinity. He is the infinity of an ultimately contracted universe, the centre of the circle. He is shown as a winged sun disk. The next Aeon, after the Aeon of Horus, is said to be the Aeon of Mart, and she was the goddess of justice. No one knows how long an Aeon will last, not even Crowley. It could be 2,000 years, as with the Aeon of Osiris, but it could be as little as 100 years. Something to think about. Anyway, that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.